My name is Sunita Narayan. I work in Delhi at the Center for Science and Environment. I'm an environmentalist. And I'm an environmentalist because I'm passionate and committed to making sure that we can have an affordable, sustainable world. The environmentalism of the poor as compared to the environmentalism of the rich is something that I have increasingly defined because of my experiences in India. And the reason is that if you look at the environmental movement as it is emerged in the rich world, in the developed world, because that's how we've inherited the environmental movement. It's really been a movement which has been what I call a band-aid movement, a movement which fixes things even as they continue to go wrong. And which is why in this form of environmentalism, the world has always remained behind the problem it has continued to create. And that is really why we are in such a deep crisis. That, as compared to the environmentalism of the poor, is an environmentalism which really seeks to find an alternate way to live differently within the means that they have. And which is why, if you look at the environmentalism of the poor coming out of my part of the world, it has really been a movement of farmers, of tribals, that is indigenous people, of poor people who are essentially not, who are fighting to secure a right to life. And that right to life includes the right to a sustainable livelihood. And a livelihood which is also built not on destroying the environment, but on building on the wealth of the environment. And that, I think, is really where the difference is. Now, I think these two movements can come together. And I see it happening more and more. And I see it particularly because I see now, and I think this is what is interesting in the world, you are seeing today the poor getting more literate, more empowered, more powerful, which is the best thing that could happen. Now, in our world, what we are finding is that it is the voice of the poor which is today saying, not in my backyard. Till yesterday, it was the rich who said, not in my backyard. So you pushed all the garbage into somebody else's backyard. Today, it's the poor who are saying, not in my backyard. Now, that requires for the rich and the poor to reinvent seriously the way we do development. And I think that's what's the most important, powerful lever for change today in the world, an increasing understanding that if we want to live in this one planet, we're really going to have to do things differently. Climate justice is really about um, living together in one planet. And that's what climate change is about. I mean, at the end of the day, climate change knows no boundaries. And the fact is that if you have um, if you pollute in the rich part of the world, it's going to make sure that we have a warming temperature which is going to lead to extreme weather events for the rich and for the poor. But it also is a fact that if the rich polluted yesterday, the poor will pollute tomorrow. Now, that's where climate justice comes in because climate justice argues that what you need to find is a better way in which the rich can reduce their emissions so that the poor can increase their emissions, but increase them differently. And the basis for climate justice is that we have one common atmospheric space. So if you have one common atmospheric space, then you have to start talking about how can you allocate that space in a way that it belongs to everybody. Not only does the right to pollution belong to everybody, but also the right to development belongs to everybody. Now, once you start understanding this, you don't use this to say the poor must pollute, but you use this to say there isn't enough space for everybody to live the life of an American, which means that you start arguing and building a new narrative that understands that if we all have to share this atmospheric space, then we all have to do something very different. Reduce our emissions, live a different lifestyle, completely change the way we do, we, we live. And I think that's what's coming out so clearly today, because still now the climate agenda, in my, in my, my understanding, has been a world of suits. And it's a world of suits because everybody wants to find what is called a win-win solution. 
But there is no win-win today. There are big losers and the losers today are the poorest of the world who are affected not because of their pollution, but by the pollution of people like you and me. And I think that's the climate injustice. And only when we understand the injustice that you and I are doing today, that we will start understanding the need for climate justice. You know, to say that the root cause is capitalism and to say that we are seeking answers again in the market to deal with climate change is of course, you know, I mean, it's a no brainer to say that's ridiculous. But that's a simple part of the answer. The more complicated part of the answer is, what do you do? Okay? And that's where we still haven't built enough of um, um, a practice of doing things differently. Where we, you know, because the whole world today is, it just knows two models. It knows capitalism and it knows communism. But the model in between, the model that will essentially talk about the needs of the poorest in this country, in the world, the needs to make sure that we have an affordable um, um, development system, and only when it is affordable and can meet the needs of all, can it actually be sustainable. I mean, that whole narrative is something that is still not strong enough in terms of our practice. And that's what excites me when I see today the changes that countries are beginning to do in their food production, in valuing uh, biodiversity, in valuing the, the labor that goes into growing food, in valuing the, uh, the ability of small producers to do uh, business so that you're actually making high-end products, not so that you're making cheap food, which is about obsolescence, which is about getting fat, which is about all the things that are wrong. But, and I think that's where, you know, um, the, the world is seeking answers. And I think we all owe it to, to do much more in actually practicing that change, being that change, so that we can show there is an alternative. I don't know if there's capitalism, I don't know if it's communism, but I do know that we need to do things differently. You know, the issue of indigenous practices has always been something that environmentalists like me and I think many of us value tremendously. We, we believe that's the culture which understands the land, the water, understands what sustainability is about. But the problem has been that when you talk about those values in a world which is so insanely unsustainable, so uns insanely out of whack, that it seems like you're talking about milk and cheese. It just doesn't seem to gel. So I think it's important for us to reassess this and to think about it from a point of view of the principles that the indigenous cultures bring us and start looking at the principles to see what can we learn from them to upscale them in today's world. Because if we don't do that, what you will do is to have this highly romantic view, this highly, you know, we, we all need to live like them, but we don't and we can't. And I think that's where we, we need a new way of understanding indigenous culture, indigenous knowledge. I'll give you a quick example from India. You know, India has an amazing traditional culture of managing water. Okay? We are a country where it rains only for 100 hours in a whole year. 100 hours in a whole year. Yet we build civilizations which learn to value every drop of rain. And we had an incredibly, in, in, amazingly sophisticated engineering understanding of it. It was part of the indigenous cultures. It was part of the traditional knowledge. But we lost it all. And today, when we talk about it, everybody looks at you and says, oh, but you know, that was OK when you were 100 years ago, when there were so few Indians, when aspirations were different. That knowledge won't work in today's India. But the fact is, the principle of the knowledge will. And the principle of the knowledge was very simple. Catch every drop of water where it falls. Make sure you harvest the water. Make sure you value the raindrop. Make sure you find diverse and 
ways of being able to do water management. Every region should have its own technology for water management because that's the need of the hour. And the last principle was very, very important, which was make sure that the system is affordable so that it is inclusive, so that it can meet the needs of all. And that, that whole principle of being able to share wealth uh, was critical because it built, and I think that's important for our world today, it built not just a just society, but most importantly, it helped to build a secure society. And our biggest problem today is insecurity. So if we take the principles of the management and we look at it from the point of view of our crisis today, then I think we'll be in a much better way of being able to build that new um, development paradigm. But if we look at it as something, something to be valued only, but not to be practiced, not to be upscaled, not to be incorporated, then we will be stuck in our two worlds. Food for change means for me a more equitable, sustainable way to grow food so that we value the land, we value biodiversity, we value the small producer um, who produces this food. And we do this in a way that we can live much better with the crisis of climate change. Today, if you look at it, the, the most vulnerable to climate change are the poorest, and it is the farmers in my part of the world. It is farmers who are today fending off extreme weather events. Their crops are being destroyed. And what they are looking for is a new practice of growing the food so that it can both cope with climate change, but it is also something that can build a more secure way of us to live. So I look at the link for food for change really about food for change means for me the linkage between food, nutrition, biodiversity and livelihood. And so and that's what will make us a more climate secure world. And I say this particularly because in India, which is ironic, and I think in large parts of the developing world, we are fighting today also a dual crisis of having malnourished people and overnourished people, which also means that food is critical in thinking about how you can provide nutrition and not bad health. So that connection is also more and more important in a world which is so climate insecure because the health burden, because the water burden, because the nutrition burden is something that we cannot take anymore. So food for change is, I believe, the way we need to go. I'm Sunita Narayan and I support food for change because it is the only way that we can build a climate secure world.